This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Juma Vishpas. Today, I'm going to present one uh, very important uh, recent guideline, that is GTD guideline number 75, that is cervical circlage. It is published on June 2022. So this is very important for January exam because you will get at least one or two questions from this guideline. So let's start with that uh, topic. So circlage in our days is a very common thing. We will see in our day-to-day -day case because of increased uh, incidence of the preterm labor, increased incidence of miscarriages. So before going to talk about circlage, we need to know that there are two types of circlage we can do. One is history indicator circlage. One is ultrasonic indicator circlage. History indicator circlage be powerful if the woman have any history of uh, recurrent miscarriage, history of any second trimester fetal loss, history of any preterm birth before 34 weeks of pregnancy, or any kind of legs procedures or any cervical cone biopsy. In that case, we can perform history indicator circlage. And usually this prophylactic measure we perform between 11 to 14 weeks of gestation. Regarding ultrasonography indicator circlage, if any point, uh, if we measure the cervical length, usually we perform it between 14 to 24 weeks of pregnancy. If you see the cervical length is less than 25 millimeter uh, in asymptomatic woman, in that case, we can also perform prophylactically circlage. Some situations uh, we can perform also emergency circlage. If we see that there's a premature cervical dilatation with exposed fetal membrane in the vagina, in that case, we can consider emergency circlage up to 27 plus six weeks of gestation. History indicated circlage we can perform in a woman who have three or more previous preterm birth. Uh, in that situation, we can perform a less than three previous preterm birth or second trimester loss without any additional risk factor. Usually, we don't perform history indicated circlage. And it's very unknown that if any woman have any specific history, like any painless dilatation, rupture of membrane, or prior cervical surgery, in that situations also we don't uh, perform history indicator circlage. So just to remember three or more previous preterm birth, in that case we perform history indicated circlage. Ultrasound indicated circlage, uh, uh, we usually don't perform without any additional risk factors for preterm birth. Uh, so you have to remember that previously, if you see any woman have a shortening of the cervical length, we can offer, but nowadays we can't offer uh, unless the patients have any additional risk factor. In any woman who have a history of spontaneous second trimester loss or preterm birth, in that case, we can offer them to go for an ultrasound surveillance for the cervical length. Uh, and if you see the length is length less than 25 millimeter or at the gestation less than 24 weeks, in that situations we can offer them uh, circlage. But if any point, if you see that there's a funneling of the cervix, that is the dilatation of the internal os on the ultrasound in absence of any cervical shortening to 25 millimeter or loss or less, that means the close the length of the cervix in that situations we don't perform. So if any point, only if you see the length of the cervix is less than 25 millimeter, um, is, if the woman have any history of second trimester loss or preterm birth, only in that situations we can offer them to perform um, a cervical cartilage. And regarding the serial sonographic surveillance uh, in a view of ultrasound indicator cartilage, uh, if any woman have a history of spontaneous second trimester loss or preterm birth, as we mentioned that we can do a serial sonographic surveillance. And if we see any point that the length is less than 25 millimeter, we can offer them to go for circulate. But regarding the ultrasound surveillance of the, of the cervical length, there is a certain criteria you have to follow. If you see that any woman have high risk, that means that if any woman have a history of previous preterm birth or second trimester loss between 16 to 34 weeks of gestation, or if you see that woman have a previous preterm pre-labor rupture of membrane less than 34 weeks, any previous use of circlage, any uterine variant, any intrauterine adhesion, any history of tracheolectomy, uh, 
In that situation, they should be reviewed in a preterm prevention clinic by 12 weeks of gestation or with the dating scan, whichever is sooner. And they also need a cervical surveillance or cervical length surveillance from two to four weeks between 16 to 24 weeks of gestation. That means if they have a very high risk in that situation, they should go for a cervical length surveillance by ultrasound every two to four weekly between 16 to 24 weeks of gestation. But if any woman have a history of um, like some intermediate risk factors over there, like if they have history of any previous full dilatation of cervix or any kind of history of cervical excisional surgery, like large loop excision of transformation zone uh, with excision depth greater than one centimeter or more than one procedures or a cone biopsy, in that case, they only need a single surveillance scan uh, that is between 11 to 22 weeks of gestation. Cervical circlage um, uh, recommended in any other groups for the woman uh, at increased risk of preterm birth. In that situation, if it is a multiple pregnancy, that is not recommended. We don't uh, do any kind of circlage in a multiple pregnancies. Regarding the cervical surgery, trauma and uterine abnormalities, um, if unless they have any kind of history of that or they are very high risk other than that usually we don't offer any circlage in case of raised bmi if they have any history of uh, of any kind of preterm labor or any miscarriage in that situations we can also offer them circlage uh, because it shows that um, if we do give us circlage that can reduce the risk of preterm labor in case of raised BMI, specifically if the BMI is more than 35. Transabdominal circlage we can offer if they have any previous unsuccessful transvaginal circlage. And transabdominal circlage can be performed preconceptionally or early pregnancy. Preconceptual procedures may be more effective and are not associated with subfertility. Okay, so trans uh, vaginal approach is the most easiest way we can perform during the pregnancy. But if any woman have any failure of the trans vaginal uh, circlage or any unsuccessful procedures, in that case, we can offer them a trans abdominal circlage preconceptionally uh, uh, or in the early pregnancy. But if we do preconceptionally, that will be much more effective and that are not associated with subfertility. Abdominal circlage can be performed either open or laparoscopically. Both have the similar efficacy. But if you perform laparoscopy, obviously the side effects are less and uh, the outcome like the uh, overall like post-operative recovery will be earlier. Emergency circlage, this decision is very individualized. Um, you have to balance the risk and benefits because you have to discuss with her about the um, risk related to the circlage in that case because there's a higher chance of rupture membrane, higher chance of chorioamnonitis, higher chance of uh, like cord prolapse. So it, they may need an emergency cesarean section. So you have to balance between that and then you can discuss with her about the options. And it shows that insertion of an emergency circlage may delay the birth by approximately 34 days in a suitable cases compared with expected management or bed rest alone. It may also be associated with twofold reduction in the chance of birth before 34 weeks of gestation. However, there are only limited data to support an associated improvement in neonatal mortality or the morbidity. So obviously, you have to decide. You have to decide that uh, based on the individual situations. But it's also proven that if you do a circlage, that can also delay the preterm labor. Advanced dilatation of the cervix, uh, that means more than four centimeter or membrane prolapse beyond the external os appears to be associated with high chance of cervical circlage failure. So in that situation, usually we don't offer any circlage. There are certain contraindications for circlage insertion. Like if you see that patient is already in active preterm labor or any evidence of chorioamnonitis, any uh, like continuing vaginal bleeding, she's already pre-prompt, 
any evidence of fetal compromise, lethal fetal defect, or fetus death, in that situations, we, we don't recommend any cervical sartlage insertion. A few informations you have to give in to the woman before cervical sartlage insertion, before history or ultrasound indicated uh, sartlage. In that situations, you have to tell her uh, there are certain risk factor in intraoperatively like bladder damage, cervical trauma, membrane rupture, bleeding during the insertion of the cervical sartlage. Cervical sartlage may be associated with risk of cervical laceration of the trauma or the trauma. If there is continuous labor with the suture in place, high vaginal sartlage insertion of the bladder mobilization usually require anesthetics to removal of um, and carries the risk of additional anesthetics. Okay, so these are the things you have to tell while you are performing the procedures. But if you undergone um, a non-emergency circlage, vaginal circlage insertion is not associated with any increased risk of pre-prompt chorioamnonitis, induction of labor or cesarean section. Insertion of the cervical suture is not associated with an increased risk of preterm birth or second trimester loss. Cervical circlage may be associated with risk of cervical laceration of the trauma. So that means um, if it is a non-emergency situation, the risk is little bit less in comparison to the um, uh, rescue, rescue circulage or emergency circulage. Preoperatively, uh, before performing the insertion of the circulage, you should offer a first trimester ultrasound and the screening to rule out any aneuploidy and also check the viabilities of the pregnancy. Also rule out is a single term pregnancy because multiple pregnancy we don't offer. And also rule out uh, that the baby have any kind of structural abnormalities. Before ultrasound indicated or emergency circulation, it is preferable to ensure anomaly scan has been performed. So it's very important to do these things before performing the procedures. And also you need to do a WBC count and C-reactive protein to rule out any chorioamnonitis if you're performing any emergency circulation to rule out any kind of infections over there. Uh, certain some questions come like, is it important to do the amnocentesis to detect the infection uh, before performing any rescue or ultrasound indicator circulation? Uh, it, the answer is actually no, as because the insufficient evidence show recommend the routine amniocentesis before rescue or ultrasound cir indicator circulation, as there is no clear data demonstrating improving the outcome. So in that situations, it is not recommended um, to do an amniocentesis to rule out the infection. In selected cases, where is a suspicious of intraamniotic infection? Amnocentesis may be performed to aid the decision about emergency circulation as the presence of infection is associated with poor prognosis. Okay, so certain selected cases, if you suspect there is an intraamniotic infection, obviously you can perf perform amnocentesis. Amnocentesis before emergency circulation does not appear to increase risk of preterm birth before 28 weeks of gestation but there is likely to some risk to perform the procedures. Okay, so uh, as a routine purpose, we don't do to de uh, amniocentesis to detect the infection. In certain situation, if you suspect there's an intraamniotic infection, before performing the procedures, you can do that, but still there's some risk associated with the procedures. Amnio reduction before emergency sections, we don't do these things. And also, um, uh, latency period to observe between the presentation and the insertion of the rescue or the ultrasound indicator circulage. This is also individual bias. Like it's um, usually there is no clean cut of period how long we will uh, follow up the case, but it's also depend on the individual situations. Should the routine genital tract screening is uh, needed for infections rule out? Routine genital screening is not needed. If we, in the presence of positive culture from a genital swab, we can give an antibacterial antimicrobials, uh, and we can discuss this with the and microbiology team, and then we can perform the circulation. So routinely we don't do that, but if you see any kind of infections, 
in that situations and recover of antibiotic we can perform. Perioperative tocolysis, tocolysis is not recommended. Even perioperative antibiotic also not recommended. That's also depend on the individual situations. If you think that the, the patients have high risk of infection, you can give a stat dose of antibiotic. Regarding the choice of anesthesia, that's also depend on the anesthetics. Um, that can be performed under short general anesthesia, or that can be also performed under regional anesthesia. Uh, cervical circlet, obviously it can be performed as a day case procedures. Uh, the, after the procedures, patient can go home. They doesn't need to stay in the hospital. Which te techniques and the material uh, should be performed? Um, here we can see the choice of suture material should be at the discretion of the surgeon. Non-absorbable suture usually we use. Choice of transvaginal circlage technique, that is the high cervical insertion with the bladder mobilization or low cervical insertion should be the discretion of the surgeon, but the circlage should be placed as high as practically possible. There is no difference between using two bursting sutures uh, and one single suture and should be at the discretion of the surgeon. Insertion of the cervical occlusion suture in addition to the primary circlage is also not routinely recommended. So that means technique and the materials also depends on the patient choice. Okay, so usually we do, do, uh, do a bursting suture is very easy to perform and we use a non-absorbable sutures. Regarding the adjuvant menos management post-operatively, Bed rest should not be routinely recommended. Patient can perform their daily activities and also abstinence from the sex um, uh, also should also not routinely recommended. A role of four circle serial sonographic surveillance of the cervical length. Uh, routinely, it's also not recommended, um, but certain situations also we can perform. Uh, like if the woman have any Ultrasound indicator circlage in that situation uh, to offer timely administration of the steroids or in utero transfer. In that case, we can perform, but routinely we don't do any um, sonographic cervical lens surveillance. In the presence of history indicator circlage, additional ultrasound indicator circlage is not routinely recommended. As compared with the expected management, it may be associated with increase in both pregnancy loss and but before 35 weeks of gestation. The decision to place emergency circlage following an elective or ultrasound indicator circlage should be made on an individual basis, taking into account clinical circumstances. So we can see that after the circlage, we don't do any routine serial sonographic surveillance. Fetal fibronectin, routinely also, we don't do um, uh, uh, you also don't do these things. Uh, however, the high predict negative predictive value of the fetal fibronectin test for subsequent birth less than 30 weeks of gestation in asymptomatic high-risk women with a circlage in place may provide reassurance to the woman and the clinicians in individual cases. So though if it is negative, if we do and if it is negative, it is very highly reassuring, but as a routine, we don't perform these things. And uh, prophylactic progesterone supplementation also not recommended. And also prophylactically any kind of progesterone or arabin pressure alone or more or less is also not effective. So there's no evidence we can also uh, support with these things. Next thing is that when we're gonna remove the circlage. So usually the circlage we remove 36 to 37 weeks of gestation. Unless birth is by pre labor caesarean section, in which case suture removal could be delayed until this time. So, if it is a caesarean section, in that case, you can remove it at the time of section. Otherwise, between 36 to 37 weeks, you need to remove that. In women presenting in established preterm labor, in that case also, you have to uh, remove that uh, to reduce the risk of trauma to the cervix. High uh, cervical circles that usually require anesthesia for removal. All the women with transabdominal circlage require birth by caesarean section. The abdominal suture may be left in place following the birth. So in case of transabdominal circlage, 
obviously they need a cesarean section for delivery and that can be kept in place for the following birth should uh, the circlage be removed following the preprom uh, if the woman have a preprom between 34 to 30 24 to 34 weeks of gestation without any evidence of infections or preterm labor you can keep this circlage for 20 uh, 48 hours um, that to consider to facilitate in utero transfer so that means 24 to 34 weeks if the woman have pre-prom in that case you can keep the circlage for 48 hours so that you can facilitate in utero transfer delayed suture removal until labor ensue uh, ensues or birth is indicated is associated with increased risk of maternal or fetal sepsis and it's not recommended given the risk of neonatal and or maternal sepsis the minimal benefits of 48 hours of latency in pregnancy with pre-prom before 23 and after 34 weeks delayed suture removal is unlikely to be advantageous in this situation okay so the thing is that in case of pre-prom always remember between 24 to 34 weeks you can keep for 48 hours just to facilitate in utero transfer more than that is not recommended because that can increase risk of maternal and or fetal infection before 23 weeks or after 34 weeks delayed removal is also not recommended okay so this is all about uh, cervical circlage so the thing is that here you have to remember that um, you know, when we do the history indicator circlage when we do the ultrasound indicator circlage what are the risk factor how we gonna do the ultrasound surveillance uh pre-operatively what we gonna do and uh what's the procedures we follow and after the operations what we gonna do and when we remove the circlage so these are the important things you need to remember in this um, cervical circlage i hope you um, uh, enjoy the video and if you want to get updated with the videos we recently post over there so like the uh, like the like uh, press the like button and also subscribe so that you can get updated uh, that's our youtube video thank you for listening